Bob's always trying to catch us saying things for the B-roll that you never see, but he's got a big bank of it somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> Not going to happen um, today, Bob. <laughs> the deal is all on script. That's right. <laughs> That'll probably be the lead of the B-roll right there. Right? There you there go. You all right, so welcome back to, uh, to the legislative session of 2022. Um, we are, uh, we're, we're operating right now in a hybrid environment. Um, we're just taking a little break here from our midday to update folks on um, some of the really exciting uh, climate initiatives that are coming before the legislature this year. And our guest this week is Neil Lunderville. Uh, and he is with Vermont Gas Systems, and he also spent a great deal of time over the last uh, several years um, working with some of our favorite um, environmentalist friends and allies um, on this concept of a clean heat standard. And so uh, we've got Neil uh, with us today. So welcome, Neil. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to join us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great to be here. It's, these are these are the topics of the times, and. Uh, I'd love to talk about them with you. I appreciate, I'll echo that uh, from Sarah. Thank you for joining us. And, and let's just jump right in. Um, you've, you've put uh, yourself forward as a supporter of the clean heat standard. We've talked to our folks a little bit about it, but um, can you just walk us through it and then, and then we'll try to dig in. What is the clean, clean heat standard? Once I can say it properly, <laughs> then we'll, we'll keep going. Well, let me, uh, maybe I'll start with a very high level of what the clean heat standard is, because I, and maybe something that a lot of your um, uh, viewers will know, uh, but there's an idea in the, in the area of how we move energy forward to do a performance-based standard, uh, which means that we are imposing a, a, a standard on uh, at different points of the industry to make sure that we're moving toward a goal that we all want. In this case, the goal that we want is the goal set by the legislature, which is reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to certain levels over the next 30 years. So, so that we're all doing our part as, as a state, the whole state, uh, to fight climate change. And for the clean heat standard, it specifically looks at the thermal sector of the overall uh, global warming challenge in, in Vermont. Global, uh, the thermal sector represents about 34% of emissions. And so it's a big, it's a big sector. It's a big contributor to this. And we have to find a way to be able to manage that, those, those greenhouse gas emissions down um, so that we provide certainty to the market, that we provide benefits to our customers, Vermonters. We give customers a choice in how they participate in the energy revolution and, and participate in their fight against climate change and do it in a way uh, that produces the least cost outcome. That is the the, the most affordable. Um, th this you know, there's no real costless options, but there are options that are better than others. And so, a clean heat standard takes in this idea of doing a performance based standard. It's imposed on uh, fuel providers, in particular, wholesale fuel fuel oil and propane dealers, and um, and VGS Vermont Gas. We're a little different. We're, we're sort of in, in between there. We sort of we're a distribution utility, but we act like a wholesaler for when it comes to natural gas. Uh, and uh, to to impose on us uh, um, these uh, credit requirements, and every year we're having to do undertake activities so that our overall greenhouse gas emissions are going down over time, in line with the Global Warming Solutions Act. That's what it does at its core. It looks a lot like if folks know. Uh, the renewable energy standard that was passed about six years ago, six, seven years ago. It looks similar to that, although there are features that are different. It's performance-based, uh, but it does require that the credits are, are produced and generated here in Vermont or delivered to Vermont to be consumed, which is a big change. Uh, but it works very similar and is built on sort of that successful performance-based standard. So that's a very high-level uh, 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 overview of what, what the idea is. So, so let me just try to summarize it back. That's how I, I know that I'm up to speed a little bit. We're, we're, we're saying to actors in this sphere of the economy, the fuel dealers crudely, that, that you'll have a predictable um, pressure on your business to help us meet our mission reductions. But it's not 
you know, bananas. It's, it's predictable. It's, it's steady so that people can build it into their, their outlook and their business planning. Is that, is that a fair summary? I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, you know, we all businesses, really all people need certainty and stability and predictability. Um, and we, so we, we have that with something like a clean heat standard with the clean heat standard that was designed by this working group that I've been part of that was been led by Rich Coward and Chris Neamey that done an amazing job with this. I mean, truly amazing, amazing in putting it together, but also bringing together a wide coalition of, of people. And that is what that that's what they're looking to do is provide this predictable path um, into the future that will allow us to manage to it and help our customers manage to it as well. Ultimately, you know, this has to, a lot of the work is going to be done by customers inside of their homes and their basements, on their roofs, and, um, et cetera. Uh, and we need to be able to work with them to, to make a very smooth transition forward um, in this. So that, that's, and that's where the fuel dealers, like you said, come into this. And, and so help us understand, you know, people may be surprised to see Vermont gas, not just kind of reluctantly at the table, but but really taking a, something of a leadership role. Square that for us um, yeah. uh, to help us understand where you're coming from there. Yeah, well, I'm I'm, I, I'm really proud of our engagement in this space. But, but just to go back a little bit, like why why is VGS interested in this? Um, in 2019, VGS launched this, its first climate plan, which put out some, uh, for then, very aggressive goals uh, to, to reduce our emissions overall. And that was built on sort of three key things. Uh, the first was reduce the overall amount of energy needed, energy efficiency and weatherization. If we can reduce the overall load that we have and bring it down, that's money that goes right back into the customer's pockets without spending any, bit, any more energy. So that is the cornerstone of any plan that the state should do on this. And it is a key part of the clean heat standards. That's the first thing that VGS said. The second thing is that uh, we need to diversify our fuel supply and make it more renewable. That looks like renewable natural gas. It looks like green hydrogen. Um, it looks like other uh, things like district energy and um, uh, geothermal, where we don't have to use fossil, fossil gas. We can displace that fossil gas entirely. And the third thing is looking for ways outside of this, like electric, beneficial electrification, where we're installing heat pump water heaters or, or cold climate heat pumps, ultimately to serve our customers. We did all of this because we understand that natural gas contributes to climate change. That is, we acknowledge that. And we also acknowledge that we have to do something about it. Um, so we have been an active participant in clean heat standard because because moving toward a, our shared climate vision is a key part of what VGS is doing as a company. We wanna make sure that our 55,000 customers continue to get safe, reliable, and affordable service, but it also needs to be green. I mean, and really green. Um, and I'm, by, by that, I mean uh, doing the kinds of things that I just talked about so that we're, we're, we're truly reducing our customer's carbon footprint. So we come to the clean heat standard very naturally. We want a uh, predictable course uh, for our, our customers, uh, one that they can count on, that we can count on, and that we can plan for um, and move our state forward to hit our ambitious goals. Something like a clean heat standard does that. And it because it's a comprehensive approach, um, we, can, we can plan for it and move to that without having to manage a patchwork of different things. And that, that, and sort of that appeals to us. I want to just finish by saying, it's not that it won't be disruptive. I mean, a clean heat standard is hugely disruptive to fossil fuel providers, but it probably needs to be hugely disruptive. Um, this is an industry that needs to be disrupted. We need to move in a different direction. Um, so we so we want to try to find the balance between being massively disruptive and being stable enough to make sure that our customers aren't feeling any of the ill effects of that. A clean heat standard meets in that balance point um, in the middle, and that's why we 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 think it's it's a, a smart policy framework to look at going forward. Thanks for all that. Um, and uh, and I, I want to turn the question around a little bit and yeah. say, you know, what role do uh, what role do homeowners play in all of this? What what role does your customer play? So um, and and I, I think I would ask you to answer that question sort of 
uh, you know, broadly enough that, um, yeah. you know, folks who are neighbors with Chris, who, whose heating fuels, you know, maybe can come in in the, in a pipe from, uh, from VGS versus people right. who live in my neck of the woods where, uh, you know, our stuff comes on a truck and, um, and, you know, gets delivered to a tank in, in our home. So how does the customer play a role in helping with this transition? Well, I, um, and, and you, you've, you've raised, a, it's a great question. And you've raised a very good point because there are, depending on where you are, it will, it, it may impact you differently, but one thing won't change. Um, a clean heat standard preserves and strengthens customer choice. Uh, customers will not be forced to change their fuel source, but they will be helped um, through, the, um, through the clean heat standard program with incentives to move to more carbon-free and, and many times more affordable alternatives. You know, when we think about um, doing a weatherization project, just for instance, which the cleaning standard would allow, weatherization project for the average Vermont home saves about 20% in energy bills. So you make an initial investment, but every month you're saving 20% on your energy bills without changing your fuel source at all. Now, if you take, if you do weatherization and you change your fuel source to a more affordable option, you're actually, you're, you're both saving money and you're, you're reducing your overall carbon footprint by, by potentially quite a bit. So it puts a lot of power in the hands of customers, which is something that we really like. Um, we also think that a program like this is going to be one of the more affordable options uh, for for customers. So, whether you're whether you're in a, a, a place where it serves natural gas or you're on oil or propane, because of the customer choice aspect and because it it is fuel neutral and lets uh, and, and and lets the fuel dealers sort of source the least cost options, it's not going to be driving up costs the way that other programs that sort of forced particular decisions. Um, might do. And I think that's a really sort of key feature. Maybe the third thing I'll mention is that a lot of this work, we're talking about weatherization and fuel switching, but fuel switching, I mean, heat, electric heat pump, water heaters, uh, cold climate heat pumps, geothermal. Uh, a lot of this work, which is done inside of a customer's home, will be done by local contractors. So there's a benefit that stays in our community by putting folks to work, um, by having people that you know that work in your community uh, to be able to do this work. And we think there's some kind of a, there is a benefit there by keeping this money, this money local. Um, and if you choose to do nothing at all, that sort of works too. Like we have, the obligation is on, on us, the, the field dealers, if you will, uh, to find ways to manage this. And we have other, other ways to do it as well. If BGS, we might look to uh, renewable natural gas, um, which is, which is a real option that has benefits that go outside of just energy and greenhouse gas emissions. It also helps uh, capture methane on farms. It helps our rural economies. So we, you know, like our project in Salisbury, Vermont, the Goodrich Family Farm, there, there are lots of great projects. We, we could put that renewable natural gas right into the pipeline and serve it, thereby making our overall uh, greenhouse gas emissions come down uh, because we're displacing fossil gas. That's another way for us to handle it. So um, I think those are the key things that I, I might mention about, about from a customer perspective, but the key is this really em empowers their choice to participate in the future um, as we move forward in this revolution. That, that's fascinating. You know, I'm, I, I like you're describing a suite, really, not one policy. And, and it reminds me of the renewable energy standard on our utilities you know, when when that was first explored in the region and here in Vermont, people were very worried about electric rates. But when taken on whole because of our investment in efficiency, even though we've increased greatly our, our dependence on renewable energy, electric energy, our electric rates are, are relatively flat. Now, I, I we have to keep doing that. We, we have to keep building on that. We're not nearly far enough along. But be, if you only looked at what we were doing to electric utilities, there was rate pressure, but because of the suite of strategies, uh, including beneficial electric, electrification efficiency, our rates have, have been more or less stable and, and actually declined compared to the region. Um, you, you, you never want to, I mean, this goes with anything, but we should never put all of our eggs in one basket. Yeah. Having a range of options uh, that we can use is going to provide both near-term uh, near-term flexibility to find the least cost, most renewable options. And it provides long-term optionality 
uh, should we have disruptions in any one of those sectors. That's a that's a strategy. I mean, how many Vermonters have both, you know, a, 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 a oil or propane boiler uh, or a coal club heat pump and a wood stove, you know, or they, are you going to have a backup? You're going to have a couple different ways so that you can, you know, depending on what's going on year to year or decade to decade, you might be uh, optimizing for, for one or the other. And I think if we zoom out to the energy sector, that's a good strategy as well. We want to make sure that all of those are increasingly renewable. That needs to be a, a common denominator among all those energy sources. Because uh, without that, I mean, we're, we're kind of we're losing the plot in the, because the plot is to bring emissions down. Um, uh, but, but a clean heat standard will do that. We, we are, seems to me like we've shifted in the last few years where people don't say in the same way they used to, it still happens, but you know that, oh my God, why do you make these choices as bad for the economy? And, and this old environment versus jobs. And, and as a, it's shifting now to, being seen as we're sort of early adopters and there are economic advantages compared to as the world changes and we recognize this obligation to get off of fossil fuels, the people that come last kicking and screaming haven't in a sense taken advantage of the opportunity. And, and I guess that's, is that a fair way of thinking about, again, why Vermont Gas, like at a shareholder, at, at, at your board meeting, you, you must have had a few sideways looks <laughs> when you first started <laughs> saying this, but is that kind of part of the spirit of this is, is we're, we're better off coming in early and, and then being able to say to our customers, to Vermonters, Hey, you know, our early investments are paying off now. Other States in the region, other communities are realizing they have to do this. Maybe federal rules are changing, whatever it is, but we're, we're sort of, uh, in a, on a better foundation because we've been innovative about this. Yeah, I, I you know, we can, the, the, the looks that you talk about, we don't really get in our board room. But we've, our, our board sees the value in this and has for, for a long time, and principally because they're of this community. They, they see what's going on here and they see the value. But we get a lot of sideways looks at like national conferences. They're like, oh, you're the Vermont utility doing all that stuff with <laughs> renewable natural gas, you know, which we're fine. I mean, we're Vermonters, so we're we're sort of used to that look and that, that's okay. Um, uh, I think there we recognize what the future looks like and we think it's important for us to move early and to, to, to create a strong foundation that will protect our customers long into the future. Like ultimately, we're, we're not anything if not for the customers that we serve. They're gonna to need to be warm, even, even if we have global warming, which we, was happening anyway, like at some level, but we're gonna still gonna have cold winters. Um, they're gonna to need to be warm. They're gonna to need to make their food. Um, they're gonna have processes that require uh, a fuel source like natural gas for, for the inside of their businesses. So something like what we do is always gonna be needed. And our question is not, is not, can, should we press forward and only do with natural gas? Is how do we best serve the warmth that our customers need for the future? Clearly the technologies are changing and they're improving. You know, things like the, like green hydrogen um, is, is a, a, a great example of something where we can take renewable electricity, um, run it over an electrolyzer and create hydrogen that we can burn alongside natural gas and renewable natural gas in our pipes. Five years ago, it's a pipe dream, literally. Now we're we're they're, they're actually doing this kind of work all around the world. This is a way for us to be ahead of the technological innovation to take advantage of it for our customers. And we think, I mean, if we if we continue to do that, that's the sweet spot that we have. Um, and we we also we, Vermont is is literally in our name. I mean, that's Vermont Gas. We want to make sure that we are in line with where the state wants to go. The Global Warming Solutions Act. It's the law, and it's clear that that's the direction that we're moving. And so, to the extent that we can marshal our forces and move in that direction without sacrificing safety, reliability, and affordability for our customers, I think we're we're in the right spot. So that, that's the abbreviated version of sort of how we got to where we are. But now it's you know we're going great guns, and and our team our team is all in uh, behind this. Um, so we're we're pretty excited about it. Sarah, any, any last question? I've got one, but but uh, turn it to you. 
You, you go ahead and, and ask your last question and, and I can close this out. Okay. Um, I got to ask you about politics, Neil, because you're no foreigner to Vermont politics, uh, a seasoned actor. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I read uh, Ethan Allen Institute thinks this is a uh, carbon tax in disguise thinks that the credits uh, we're describing here are a means of control uh, of, of favoring uh, elite businesses that are well-connected like Efficiency Vermont and things like that. that you hear, I mean, this is new, right? I, I, first of all, are other places doing this like we're contemplating? And then how do you answer um, particularly the right-wing detractors who, who, who think this is... Uh, an evil scheme. Well, there's a there's a lot in that that question uh, there, <laughs> so I'll, I'll I'll try to to hit the, the points. I mean the the, um, the the clean standard itself is a is a fairly new iteration of models that have been proven. Even in Vermont, we have a performance based standard with our renewable energy standard, our RES for electric utilities. So it's based on a very similar construct to that, with with I think improvements that will sort of that we've learned over the, the years with RES that will make it even better for thermal, provide more certainty, uh, both in meeting our goals and provide more certainty for businesses. So uh, we only need to look in our own backyard to see something that, that has worked for Vermont and been successful here. Um, and, and we can take all the learnings we've done with RES and apply it to this, uh, to the clean heat standard. I think that's an, that's an important piece of it as well. Um, you know, there are always folks who have critiques of, of any proposal that come forward. I've heard critiques from the right. I've heard critiques from the left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think we, we do, you know, when I hear about, uh, about some critiques around cost, I'm very clear. There's no costless proposal um, because that's that's just, we, there's not, that's, that's not true. It doesn't work like that. There's always cost. And the question is, how can we, minimize those costs to the greatest extent possible while advancing toward a goal that we all share, which is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I believe that a clean heat standard does that. It has cost, um, but we also think, especially as VGS, we think we are well positioned to manage those costs for our customers going forward in such a way that, that their energy bill will remain one of the lowest cost bills that, that they have. I think for a lot of Vermonters with a clean heat standard, they will see their energy bills come down. We know that if we can do weatherization at scale, if we can get another 90,000 homes of low and moderate income customers weatherized, their bills are gonna go down 20%. There's a cost to that on the front end. It's an investment on the front end that saves money over time. It has a return on that investment. Just weatherization alone, just on this point, every dollar we put into weatherization, there's a direct $1.50 savings for energy over the lifetime energy savings on, on weatherization. Um, I'm very passionate about weatherization because it's the kind of investment, it's, it makes total sense. They should, everybody should be for it. We make an investment to save money. And we, when, we're, when we're making that investment in weatherization, we're not just saving money, we're also reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we're also improving health outcomes, we're also getting folks to be able to turn their uh, thermostat from 60 degrees up to something a little bit more manageable. People shouldn't have to be cold in their homes. I mean, this seems like a pretty basic thing. Um, but we do that through weatherization. Well, weatherization is exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about with a clean heat standard. It's exactly the kind of way that literally every home in Vermont can participate in fighting climate change, but also putting money back in their own pocket. This is something that seems like, like I don't think this is a left or right issue. This is a common sense issue and one where we want to be making a big investment because we get so much savings um, on the back end. So that's one way that I would push back on this is to say like there are investments inside of this that will save the most vulnerable Vermonters real money on day one if we are able to do that. So we should be doing those now. And oh, by the way, they also help the planet. I mean, that that seems like a that seems like a twofer. Um, yeah. Geez, I got, I got off my weatherization, Chris. I I I I feel like uh, I think I answered most of your your question yeah. there. But um, I I do think that you know there eventually um, we are go well actually not eventually we have to reckon with what's going on with the planet and the warming that's that's occurring. Um, we, have we have choices today. We have opportunities to do this in a rational, sensible way that makes sense for our state and the, the kinds of challenges that we have. 
we may not have those choices in two years or five years. And I doubt we'll have them in 10 because by that point, it'll be a crisis. And we always know the best time to, to fix the proverbial roof is not when it's leaking. Well, I mean, I would say it's pretty much leaking already with climate change. So we can we can fix it before it blows away in a hurricane or, or a tornado, because that, that's really what we're going to be seeing. And it's not to be alarmist at all. And I'm certainly not. I'm just saying this is the right time to handle sort of a, a generational type change when we still have opportunity to make good choices. And I think the clean heat standard, something like it, well, as to, it may be disruptive and it may have you know, some cost. We'll have the ability to manage those the best way possible if we act now and we act you know, together. And that means sort of growing the, the group of people who think this is a good idea. And you know, we're proud to be part of that group of people um, who thinks that's a good idea. So, sorry, I got a little bit on my soapbox there when it came to weatherization, but I, it's uh, something that is near and dear to my heart. Well, you know, the, the words that you're saying are definitely music to my ears. Um, you're talking about uh, maintaining customer choice, uh, and you're also talking about homes that are uh, cleaner, greener, safer, and less expensive to, uh, to live in. And so um, these are all, you know, really good aspirations for us to, to point to. And, and I think um, the opportunities here uh, for Vermonters are, are real and I appreciate your understanding of the sense of urgency because we really don't have time to uh, to to waste uh, and uh, and given that weatherization is such a big part of it um, this is a, a really exciting uh, move forward uh, so we really appreciate you coming in to talk with us today um, it's it's really kind of you to make time out of your busy day to uh, to help us uh, help our viewers understand what the clean heat standard is um, this is a, a concept that has been under development um, with, you know, uh, environmentalists and economists and, uh, and industry folks for a number of years and is now making its way through the legislative process. So uh, before we sign off, um, you know, just want to remind folks that you can follow along in the legislative process by going to the legislative website. Um, you can watch live um, if you want to watch the committee hearings as they happen. You can also watch them on YouTube, which is a great way to watch them because you can turn up the speed to one and a half or two times, and then you don't get the long pauses between words and questions. Um, but it's a great way to stay on top of what your legislature is doing. And we really hope you will because we want you to get in contact with us and, uh, and share with us your thoughts. So Neil, thank you so much for coming with uh, to, to speak with us today. And um, I look forward to seeing you someday again in person. Yeah, it's very much my pleasure and look forward to working with you on this and all the issues that are facing Vermont. Thanks for your leadership um, and, and keep at it. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much. And thanks again, obviously, to Bob the Green Guy who makes these videos possible. Um, I, you know, he doesn't have a whole lot to work with, but he occasionally <laughs> makes us look good. So uh, thanks, Bob. We really appreciate your help.